to the saints of God and to all our visiting friends, we're thankful that you all are here. On behalf of the eldership, our brother Lindsey Baker Jr., Richard Nelson IV, and myself, Brother Gail Nelson, our deacons, Baker, Dowdell, Ferreras, and James, welcome to the Church of Christ and Meets on Miami Gardens Drive. Before we get into our lesson tonight, we will first uh, begin with a word of prayer. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Gracious God, our Father, we are thankful for yet another day. We're thankful for life, health, and strength. We recognize your power, your grace, and your mercy. Please be with all those that are with us tonight to study your word. Please be with those who are under the doctor's care, or facing any type of physical ailment. Be with those who are sick spiritually, who do not see the need to assemble, study, and or worship. Dear God, we just pray that as we live at a time where mankind is using words such as accountability and justice, may we recognize that the true accountability is to you. And when we are accountable to you, you are a just and merciful God who extended his grace to us that allows us to be who we are. And for that, we are thankful. Be with us tonight as we study your word. May it be taught in simplicity, without compromise. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, we want to, first of all, just give you the Bible questions. And what we will begin to do, uh, most likely, God willing, starting next week, is give you the Bible questions. We're going to put it up probably starting at 645 before class to give you all the opportunity to write it down, to uh, just see uh, the questions we want to talk about. Uh, and so the Bible questions for tonight, what does in particular mean in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27? Question number two, what does the word conversation mean in the original Greek? Some of this, we, much of this we touched on on Sunday, but it's a review for some. It may be new to others, but nevertheless, it's Bible study for all of us. Number three, what does the word nature mean in the original Greek? And question four of four, what does it mean to follow? in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 1, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. I'll just give you a few seconds to go ahead and write those down. We'll give you a little bit of time to work on your respective answers. It's so good seeing people writing things down. This is Bible study, and we want you to have the time to write things down and hopefully do your best to answer the questions and rest assured we will provide the answers, the Bible answers, to each of those questions at the appropriate time. Just take a minute or so to write those down. And for some of you that may be listening, I'm sensitive to that, that may be on the phone. Question one, what does in particular mean in 1 Corinthians 12 and 27? Question two, what does the word conversation mean in the original Greek? Question three, uh, what does the word nature mean in the original Greek? And question four, what does it mean to follow in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 and Ephesians 5 and 1? Hopefully you had enough time to write that down or at least get the key words so you can work on those and we'll give you the opportunity to put your answers in the chat. For those of you that don't put it in the chat, write it down in your notebook wherever you may keep those notes. Our lesson tonight, building on, it's really part two of what we started on Sunday, but our, our lesson tonight is a new nature, a new nature. And as we think about the word of God this evening, I want us to be mindful of, you know, again, certain key words. We talked about nature. We talked about conversation. We're going to deal with all that uh, tonight. Our lesson text comes to us from 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse number 3. 2 Peter chapter 1 beginning at verse number three. <clears throat> Here Peter writes, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There's a battle that's going on. 
I mean, he's as we talk about God's elect, uh, we have, and we, as we think about nature, as we think, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I was about to answer some of those questions, but I caught myself. Uh, let's just take a look at it sequentially. So Peter is saying that we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let's move on. So when we think about nature, we got to understand, let's look at it from the most fundamental aspect, mankind. Where there is mankind, there will be problems. Not breaking news at all. Where there is mankind, there will be problems. If I were to go back to the previous slide, we've escaped, Peter says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all that is in the world. That's, I mean, when you think about it from that vantage point, we need to recognize that there is nothing uh, in this world that we ought to uh, enjoy or desire more than the almighty God. And so having said that, uh, let's spend a little time uh, as it relates to nature. And what I just quoted was found in 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 15 through 16, really first, verse 16. For the, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. I wanted to make sure you had that in your notes. So we've escaped that as children of God. But we as Christians can and will, if we are not careful, if we don't follow God, we can act worldly too. And we can miss out on eternity. So brother, it sounds like you're saying a Christian can fall from grace. Hold your horses. <laughs> where, there will be, where there is mankind, there will be problems. Mankind is full of trouble. May we never lose sight of this. I'm not seeking to be negative. I'm not seeking to be pessimistic. I'm just telling you the truth. Where there is man, there will be problems. The nation held its collective breath on one case, a legal case involving more than two men, but in particular, one who was in a position of authority and one who was, in a, was subject and subjected to said authority. Authority can be misused, power can be misused in any career, in any occupation. But brothers and sisters, I tell you this, that was man's judgment. God is the ultimate judge. We all have a soul. And we certainly want everyone to be treated fairly and people should be held accountable, anyone, any profession for violating the law. But what I'm talking about tonight is something much greater, much higher than any law because not only can man render justice but the, com the conversation nationally is about, wow, well, well, here's one out of so many that where justice was not served. And what I'm saying to each of you tonight, not seeking to get political, not seeking to focus more on the flesh than the spirit, but I'm comparing and contrasting man's judgment, which oftentimes can be wrong. Sometimes it can be right. That's such as life with man. But when it comes to God, you can count on his judgment. You can count on God's accountability. And speaking of that, Job says in Job chapter 14 and verse one, man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. Man that is born of a woman is of a few, uh, is, is a few days and full of trouble. Mm. And when we talk about children and how they grow up and how children, what they are exposed to, train them. Proverbs 22 and six teaches us, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, why do we need to train up a child? That was Proverbs 22 and six, because you drop down to verse 15 of Proverbs chapter 22. And the Bible says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction, the rod of correction will drive it far from him. So we recognize the necessity for discipline, the necessity of training. There's, instruct, there's instructive discipline, teaching. There's corrective discipline, accountability. And so it is amazing how when people talk about and ask you the question, well, uh, do you spank your child? I trained my children. And training up my children included discipline. 
training my children included. If I told you to do something, you didn't do it. There are consequences. So there is no question because the Bible talks about the rod of correction. That rod ain't a timeout. <laughs> that rod wasn't let's reason together. Let's sit down eye to eye as if we are peers. Oh no, there has to be authority and there has to be chastisement, discipline. And so if you ask me that direct question, I'll tell you exactly that the answer is yes. There is certainly discipline and it is paid off. And I'm thankful to God. My children are have yielded to the nurture and admonition of the Lord and they yielded to the head of the household and, and joined by a loving wife and helped me. That's how God designed it. Don't let the world fool you. So the Bible says that mankind, you got man, there will be problems. Talking mankind, not just the male factor. Proverbs 22 and 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You got you to make sure you correct, redirect, and most importantly, love. Having said that, let's talk about God's grace. We know God's grace by definition means unmerited favor. God's grace is getting what grace by definition is getting what we do not deserve. And so God has given us an opportunity, recognizing the frailty of man, recognizing the foolishness of man, recognizing that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, recognizing that there is a nature that yields to the lust and desires of the flesh and not to God. So there's a, you know, we talk about the natural man and the spiritual man. Look at what God has done for us. God has given us an opportunity to take on a new nature and change our conversation. Now, conversation, I'm conversing with you tonight as I teach this class. But conversation takes on a, a new context, a deeper context in the original Greek, as you'll find in just a minute. So because of God's grace, his unmerited favor, something we did not deserve, we have an opportunity to take change our nature and our conversation. When we are reborn, underscore born in your notes, reborn, born again, we're given a new nature. When we obey the gospel, we are given a new nature to develop new habits. And that word nature, for your notes, as mentioned on Sunday, nature, natural. When something becomes natural, hmm, you've done it more than once. So when we think about salvation, and I'm, I'm giving you all a little bit more time to put those questions, those answers in the chat. Here's an example. In Acts chapter 15, and this is beginning at verse 1, God's plan versus man's plan of salvation. See, you got to be careful when it comes to mankind. And for our visiting friends, thank you for being with us. And for those who are outside the body of the Church of Christ, you're in the right place. The Bible says in Acts 15 and 1, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Wait a minute now. Hmm. So these men taught brethren, brothers in Christ, that unless you are circumcised after the manner, the pattern of Moses, you can't be saved. So in essence, they're bringing something from the Old Testament as a mandate in order for you to be saved in the New Testament church. When therefore, verse two, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they argued over this thing. This was no small matter. You, you don't have to be circumcised with the New Testament church. No, you gotta be circumcised after the manner of Moses or you can't be saved. That was the teaching. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Let's take it to the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. Hmm. But I, what I love about the Bible, you don't have to go very far. Stay in the same book, stay in the same chapter, drop down to verse seven. And when there had been much disputing, I just told you there was dis, a disputation, verse one. When, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And so it is. Peter in Acts 15 and 7 says this, this choice, this decision has already been made. God already let us know. It's not through circumcision. It is by the gospel that mankind is saved. And when Peter himself preached at the house of Cornelius, 
that's when the Gentiles, the first Gentiles to be saved, not through circumcision, but through the gospel preaching. And God in verse eight, which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, Peter speaking, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, not by circumcision. So Peter is saying there's no difference, Jew and Gentile, when it comes to saving souls, it is not about black and white. It is not about race and ethnicity. You know, be, be, pr be proud of your heritage. Don't, you know, don't, because again, thank God. I will never, ever uh, be ashamed of who I am. But most importantly, I'm thankful to God for what I've become by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are, there are Christians who may focus more on race than they do on grace. I've seen brothers and sisters leave the church and make other things their quote unquote religion. As you all know, Rick and I talk about it all the time. Uh, you know, and again, you think about your eldership, you know, brother Lindsay, school, he yeah, was a re retired school teacher giving back to the community. Brother Rick is teaching currently. We work together in juvenile justice, community, community, community. But that won't save anybody's soul. It's helpful, helping kids, helping families, but you can build relationships that can lead people to the Lord's church. Community service is not the gospel. It's good to do good for people, if you will. But don't ever make, don't, don't get that twisted and think that just by giving somebody some food, that's salvation. No, sir, no, ma'am. Good works are good works. They are good, but that's not the gospel. So Peter is making it plain in verse 10. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God? Don't come in here with this circumcision mandate. Don't tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor, nor we were able to bear. You couldn't handle the whole law. That's why God brought something better, the gospel and gave us a chance to take on a new nature. But we believe, Paul, Peter says in verse 11, that through the grace, there it is again, through the unmerited favor, we got some we didn't deserve. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they, Jew and Gentile alike, not through a circumcision mandate, but through the gospel. This was already decided. So when they came, and there's a reason I'm taking you here, when they came and taught the brethren that they must be circumcised, Peter had to stand up as men need to do today and teach the truth. So brothers and sisters, Christians can fall from grace. Now look at Galatians five in context now, beginning at verse number one. Stand fast therefore in the liberty, the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Let me go back. Peter just talked about a yoke that the fathers could not bear in verse 10. What was a yoke? They were trying to bring back. You know, a yoke is a harness that goes on the necks of two animals. Like let's say a yoke of oxen. You got two oxen, big animals side by side. You put the harness, the yoke on them to make sure they go in the same direction. It also keeps control. And so back to Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled, get it, yoke, and be not entangled, caught up with a yoke of bondage. Don't try to bind that circumcision on me. Don't try to bring back denomination, and the same thing today, denominationalism. Don't put that in the church. We don't need any of that in the church. Why don't y'all do this? Why don't y'all do that? We don't need any of that. Look at what Paul says, behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You try to do all that outward stuff, Christ will have no effect on you. you. You mandate circumcision. For I testify again, verse three, to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you're gonna try to bring the whole law or pieces of it as a, as a mandate, then do everything. Look at Paul. He said, okay, you're gonna do all these offerings? Do all of that then. Don't just try to have your little uh, a la carte circumcision mandate for salvation. I love this teaching with Paul. Christ has become of no effect unto you, verse four. Whosoever of you are justified, declared not guilty by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Let me pause here. Let me be as clear as I can. Christians can fall from grace. 
There is no once saved, always saved doctrine. And so the example in Acts 15 of a circumcision mandate, when you see the word mandate, short for mandatory, mandatory by definition means it is required. Circumcision is not required for our salvation today. At one time, after the manner of Moses, it was part of the law, but we are no longer under the law. Amen, saints. For we, verse five, through the spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, here it is, neither circumcision, the Jew, availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, the Gentile, but faith, which worketh by love. So faith, of course, hope and charity, but the greatest of these is it's charity or love. So I wanted you all to have this as an intro to make sure we recognize that God has given us an opportunity to take on a new nature through grace. And it is by grace that we are saved. Well, on Sunday, I introduced a, a scripture and this is where we segue into our lesson. Well, deeper into our lesson tonight. Then we're going to the, your chat to see your answers right after this. Paul writing the same Paul in Ephesians chapter two, beginning at verse three, among whom also we all had our conversation, behavior, conduct in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature, origin, birth, the habit formed over time, children of wrath, even as others. So now let me quickly go to the answers, uh, but, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Because some of you saw the answers right there. So let's check your answers in the chat. Let me take a peek at this quickly. Let me go to the chat. All right, you all had a little extra time. Let's see what we have, Darcy, member of it. So what does in particular mean, member of it, conduct, behavior? Uh, looking at the Greek word, phusis, inherit, in, inherit origin of birth, imitate, mimic. Tyrone Tinsley, part of the team, lifestyle, conduct, origin, natural response, imitate, mimic, love it. Dowdell's individual lifestyle, behave, conduct, imitator, good, wonders, excellent. Look at it. Now you guys are giving me the Greek words. I want you to give me what it means because I don't want people thinking you're just trying to show off now with this ana, anastrefo and phusis. Those are exactly right. Those are the Greek words for conversation and nature, but tell me what they mean in, their, in basic English. Uh, imitate. Good, good, good. Sheila Muckle, conversation. Look at you. You guys take good notes. Conversation, behavior, conduct, lifestyle. Jeanette in particular. Look at this. Uh, far to the same teacher's pet still showing out. All right, Greek behavior. I love it. Very good. Valerie Caraballo. Excellent. David Aldridge Jr. I love it. Look at you. Give me the Greek word and the definition. Excellent. Tina Dangerfield. Let's see what you have here. I'm very impressed with this. You guys did a wonderful job. For the benefit of those who did not go to the chat, and that's certainly fine. What does in particular mean in 1 Corinthians 12 and 27? The Greek word breaks down. It means to have a part, a share, a portion. Uh, Brother Tinsley put, we're part of the team. I love that. You know, again, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 27, the Bible says, and ye are, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And so with that, uh, that's the, I just quoted that verse for time's sake, but ye are, now who, to whom is, who's speaking? Paul. To whom is he speaking? The, the church of Christ located at Corinth. What's he talking to them about? He's talking about the oneness of the body and the individual responsibilities, individual parts. Because in that same chapter, you know, Paul talks about the, he uses the physical body as an example, illustration. If everybody were the hand, where are the feet? If everybody was a mouth, if everybody was an ear, we need all parts of the body. Say amen if you understood what I just did there. Give me an amen in the chat. Y'all follow me on that. Come on now. Let me see where we're at. Come on now. Where we at? Somebody said, really don't understand. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Y'all stop talking about my teacher's pet. Leave that alone. Uh, so you, <laughs> you're going to lose that teacher pet, little Jeanette. Quit, don't respond to Ty. He's a troublemaker. Uh, so amen. All right. Y'all good. I see y'all still follow me. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you all. So in particular means a part, a share, a portion. And so having said that, uh, we all are a part of the, of the, of the church. And one member, uh, again, uh, can, can fall, but the church is still going to be intact. 
That's why we have to do our part, do our share. We all play a role in this one body, the church of Christ. So in particular, in the Greek means a part, a share, a portion. What does the word conversation mean in the original Greek? And it's less about the Greek word. And many of you put that in the, your answer, but I want you all to know what it means. When you see it in context, it really makes it easier to understand and it makes it easier for you to apply. So the word conversation, obviously in the original in English, you know, you, when you converse, you talk to someone, but now we're talking about our behavior, our conduct, our lifestyle, how we act is our conversation. So in Paul in Ephesians 2 that we just read, we all had our conversation in time past. Now let's break that down. We all had our conversation, behavior, conduct, lifestyle, in time past. Paul in Ephesians 2 was writing to Christians. What, why would Paul write to Christians and talk about previous conduct, previous behavior? Because he, in essence, said, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that, he said that in Ephesians 2. The same Paul said the same thing in Romans 3 and 23. So we all have a past. So conversation means our behavior, our conduct, our lifestyle. The word nature, what does the word nature mean in the original Greek? Origin, the beginning, birth, the beginning. And because from birth and from the beginning, if you will, of our physical lifestyle, there's a mode of, of feeling, acting, which by long habit has become nature. That word long habit, pattern. There's a pattern of behavior. If you always get what you want from the time you were a baby, when you the first time you don't get what you want, you're going to cry like a baby. Real simple, called conditioning. And you show me an adult who can quote unquote act a fool, probably because of, they, you show me a child who probably acted a fool as well, unless somebody redirects him or her. So brothers and sisters, what I'm saying to you tonight is Paul is addressing a pattern of behavior, a nature that can change with God's help. So what does it mean to follow? Speaking of God's help, it means, as you said in the chat very accurately, to imitate, emulate, or even mimic. So when you think about follow, 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul is saying, imitate me, emulate me, because I'm emulating Christ. I'm following, imitating Christ. Ephesians 5 and 1, be ye followers as dear children. Here it is, following God. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. As you think about children growing up, I remember our daughter, Alexis, you know, she's 18 years old now, a young woman, a young lady. And but when she was a little girl, she put on Chantel, my wife's uh, high heels. And I remember we got a picture of her with her little uh, one, a hat and putting on, she wanted, she saw her mama all dressed up and she, a little girl. Yeah, again, just a little girl seeking to just emulate, imitate what she saw. So there's a point to be made there. Put the right things in front of your kids. There are those who have left the church because of the foolishness they saw in their own homes. If the shoe fits. There are those who are no longer faithful to God because they have not seen a consistent pattern of behavior. Be open and honest with your kids. If you make a mistake, own up to it. It may hurt, but I'm still going to tell you the truth. So when we follow God, when we imitate, emulate, mimic God, we take on or we, it, we exhibit the divine nature that God is talking about. As we think about the word imitate, and I just want to just hit the nail one more time. I shared this with you on Sunday. That word mimetes, the root word is mimic. English word, I should say, the derivative is mimic, one who imitates or emulates. But look at this one, the positive imitation that comes from admiring the pattern set by someone worthy of emulation. Not everybody is worthy to imitate. Quit trying to act like all these celebrities and everybody else. Be yourself. Imitate God. A mentor setting a proper example. Mentorship is, I mean, that's the business I'm in. I'm in a business of mentorship, helping kids, helping others. But put the right thing in front of somebody. And the ultimate example to emulate, imitate, and be mentored by is the almighty God through his son, Jesus Christ. So a new nature means a new and improved conduct. New and improved conduct. Let me just pause for a minute, make sure everybody's good. Give me a temperature check. 
Everybody all right? Amen is truly the so. I was want to say an amen or a yes. That's fine. I always pause now. I want to make sure my pace is too fast. I was a few minutes behind schedule. Everybody good? Amen. All right. See, si, senor. Amen. All right. So a new nature, improved conduct. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, when does this transition occur? Remember God's grace. We're saved by grace, saved by the gospel. So we become new creatures, a new spiritual creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're still the same height, still the same weight, still same race and ethnicity. Not talking about the physical. Your new spiritual, you, you have a new spiritual slate. Our new brother Derek, our new brother Damien, our new brother Josue, all new creatures in Christ, new creatures, Christian. The old conversation, the old man of sin has been crucified with Christ. That's why Paul says in Galatians 2 and 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 and verse 20. And having said that, you know, we thank God to be new in Christ. So we have an obligation, Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 1, to walk. That word walk means to live. That word, when we live, we have our conversation. Conversation is our conduct. So back in the day, we used to, used to say, how you living? And some people will respond, Lord, how you living? So the key is the word walk. I want to come back to my roots there for a minute. Uh, that word walk means how you live. And so if somebody were to ask you, how, you, how are you living? Our, be, our conversation should be consistent with Christ. Our conversation is based on the new nature, the divine nature, not the old man of sin. Don't just do what everybody else does. Peculiar means different. Distinctive means not like everybody else. Therefore, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Ephesians 4 and 1 on your screen, beseech, plead with you that ye walk, live worthy of the vocation, the profession. Christians are professional. We need to know. We, need, we are equipped. We need to know the Bible. You don't have to quote everything, but know where to go in that book. That's why we're in Bible study. Walk worthy, live worthy of the vocation, the profession wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness, not going around being a know-it-all, teach people with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. You got to put up with me, I got to put up with you. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We're in this together. So if all of us had a conversation, all of us have sinned, and now here we are, one team, one body, everybody playing their part, having a share or a portion of this body, the least we can do, the least we can do is recognize that I had to grow. I had to come from something and so did you. So we got to work together on this thing. That's why it's called in particular. So turn your, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter two. I got to hasten on now. Hebrews chapter two. I got to look at this very quickly. Hebrews, the second chapter. And we'll, we'll begin reading about verse 11. Because we're going to talk about the church briefly. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews, the second chapter. And we'll begin reading it about verse number 11. I was about to say, say amen when you can, but I can't hear you. So I'll go ahead and <laughs> you can still say amen. I assume you are there. Hebrews 2 beginning at verse 11. I didn't, I didn't have the space to put it all on the slide, so I just kept the slide blank. Just follow me as I read. Hopefully you have your Bibles. Hebrews 2 beginning at verse 11. Divine nature. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, one body, one team. Remember in particular. So sanctify means set apart, set apart for divine use. For both he that sanctifieth and setteth apart and they who are sanctified are all of one. For of which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We are in the same spiritual family with Christ. He's the one who helped He's the one who sanctified us through God the Father. I mean, obviously, God the Father sent his son. Son, you said, I'll send you another comforter. So the Godhead, we are sanctified. It's God's love, it's Christ's sacrifice, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are set apart. Don't forget that point. 
Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. He didn't say I'm going to jump on a banjo. I don't want to get another lesson there. I will sing praise in the church. In the church, may we never stop singing. I'm not talking about entertaining one another. Singing praise to God. 13, I got to hurry up. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I, I, I and the children which God hath given me. God's children are sanctified. The sanctified are in the church. And the church is one headed by Jesus Christ. Verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. We are still in the flesh, but we have the, we have the gift of the Holy Ghost, but we are still in the flesh, but we take on a new nature because of the gospel. I hope y'all got me. Hope you are with me. Let's continue. Verse 14, he also himself likewise took part of the same. In other words, God became flesh. Who was that? That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. God, who was divine, became flesh, John 1 and 14. Be Jesus became flesh so that he could defeat the devil. The devil had power over death. So Jesus had to defeat death. He became flesh to defeat death. The one who had power over death, the devil. Good Lord. And the, not only did Jesus have victory over death, hell, Hades, and the grave, because he rose from the dead so that we might rise up to walk, live, conversate in a brand new way of life. Lord, have mercy. And not only did Jesus, not only you talk about, I think about the Avengers, I think about superheroes. Nobody's greater than Jesus. He became flesh to defeat the devil. And not only did he defeat the devil, verse 15, and deliver, save, rescue them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. If we are, if, again, if no one, as we deal with the loss of life, as we deal with the, the frailty of our human bodies, we are all here tonight because I hope, trust, and pray we look for something beyond this world. If our only hope is in this world, we're of all men most miserable. Christ rose from the grave so that we could have a look forward to eternity. For verily, verse 16, truly he took not on him the nature of angels. He didn't stay celestial. Jesus became terrestrial. Terra in the Latin means ground, means dust. So celestial, thinking about divine, you know, again, a celestial body like angels. He didn't take on the form of angels, the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Christ became flesh. Christ, the son of man, but he's a son of God. That's why he's called son of man. The son of God became flesh, therefore son of man. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be, to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. A high priest went to God once a year on behalf of the people. The fact that Christ became man now he is a greater high priest because he goes to God. We go to God through him, through our high priest, Jesus Christ. And he, the high priest had sins in the Old Testament. He had to atone for his own sins. We got a better sacrifice in Jesus Christ. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Here it is. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or help them that are tempted. We have a high priest in Jesus Christ who knew, who had no sin. And that high priest, the priest, we as priests of God go through the high priest, Jesus Christ, to get to the father. What they did once a year, we can go to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ any day we want, every single day. Thank God for that. I got to pause. I'm, I'll finish up in a minute. I got to go. I got to open up this chat for a minute. Uh, y'all are doing all right. Did y'all understand that? Did y'all get that? Come on, somebody. If you didn't, I'll see you on Sunday. Don't put it. If you didn't get it, don't put anything on there. I want to know if you got it. If you, did you get it? Come on now. Amen, Lewis family. As we think about, thank y'all. Again, Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Christ became flesh 
to be the example, to be mimicked, to be imitated, to be followed. Keep putting those amens up there. Y'all get me hyped up. Jesus Christ became flesh to defeat Satan and to deliver us. So don't tell me about circumcision. Don't tell me about anything else. I want the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we are, we are Christians. I don't want to be a Baptist. I don't want to be a Lutheran. I don't want to be a Presbyterian. I just want Christian means belonging to Christ. I belong to the master, to the savior. And as we think about God, as we close out tonight, if we fail to imitate or follow God, we are warned, don't get caught up in this world. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. See, grace is getting what we didn't deserve. Mercy, mercy is not getting what we deserve. And so as we think about the word of God tonight, uh, the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The least we can do is present our bodies a living sacrifice. We need to live, have a conversation that's pleasing to God. This is our reasonable service, the least we can do. And in doing so, don't yield to the fleshly nature, yield to the divine nature. Because, you know, again, the Holy Spirit indwells us to guide us through his word. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by, by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, don't get caught up in the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. And what does James, our brother, tell us to do? Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, basically overflowing of the carnal nature, set it aside. Most, most Christians, most, not all, may have more experience, may have more experience in the world than they do in spiritual things. So you got to lay, lay, lay all that aside. When I get mad back in the day, I would say stuff. Well, guess what happens, brother? You, you get mad, you're in a business meeting. What are you going to do? You're going to act like a Christian. Sister, you get mad uh, back in the day, you used to cuss and gossip. What are you going to do now, sister, when you get mad? You act like a Christian and pray and say, brothers, can I talk? Can I do this? Can I, can I, we have a meeting? That's how you handle it now, sister, brother, no gossip, no foolishness. And when you see that in the church, it is not the divine nature. That's the carnal nature because we are in the habit of dealing with things that way. Lay aside all filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Brothers and sisters, it all happened on the cross. When we were born again, having escaped the corruption that is in the world, it was because of what Christ did. He died to defeat Satan, and he did. And when he defeated Satan, he was able to deliver us. So we should not fear death. And God knows we have families that are in bereavement at this time. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the Baker family. Thoughts and prayers go out to those who are uh, who have recently lost loved ones, the Stevens family. And so brothers and sisters, let us never forget, take, ne never take lightly the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Now you see in scripture why he died. And we who are children of God who have become Christians. That pattern of redemption, that scheme of redemption, of hearing and believing the, God, Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Acts 15 and 7. Now you see Acts 15 and 7. Don't ever forget that. When Peter's, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know how a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. We must hear and believe the gospel. Jesus says in Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You must change your mind. Turn from sin and turn to God. Confess Christ to be the son of the living God, Acts 8 and 37, as the Ethiopian eunuch did. Be baptized for the remission and washing away of your sins. And then rise up to walk, to live, to conversate and a, until death. Revelation 2 and 10. And Jesus says, I will give thee a crown of life. Jesus won. We have victory. When we sing that song, victory in Jesus, 
it's because he won. The devil is still seeking influence. The devil is busy, but guess what? At the end of the day, we won.